Thank you, uh, Fran. Uh, good to be here and uh, good to hear uh, the last part of this conversation. It's sort of inspiring to um, hear norms change. I think those of us in the, what we still laughingly called the for-profit side of journalism, uh, it took a, a while to get norms to change around paying for journalism. And it's exciting to see norms to change around supporting journalism. Uh, and if we can get people to think that that's the natural and, and right thing to do, uh, it'll make our industry so much stronger. So it's exciting for me to get dip my toe into what you guys are doing. Uh, I also you know, wanted to say why I'm here as chairman of Weave, even though I'm a fellow journalist, though I'd love to talk about journalism generally. I did something a couple of years ago. Every piece I was writing was about social disconnection in some way, uh, whether it was the opioid crisis, the rise in suicide rate, the rise in polarization. And so I decided it was one of those like silent Pearl Harbor moments where you're all called to do something a little extra. And so to me, I felt like, well, I'll write my column, I'll do stuff like that. But uh, I wanna try to get involved in boosting up the voices because there, there are not only um, lots of social disconnection, a lot of alienation, a lot of polarization, a lot of division and hatred, there are people healing it on the local level everywhere you go in the country. And so we founded Weave really to, to lift up the voices of those uh, who are doing it. And there are people like Pancho Arguilas in Houston who runs something called the Living Hope Wheelchair Association. And what Pancho does is you take undocumented workers who've fallen and broken their backs, usually on construction jobs, and he gives them wheelchairs and diapers and catheters and anything they need to lead a dignified life. And then he, he helps them become social workers. And so you'll get 25 guys in wheelchairs wheeling in your neighborhood to do work for your community. Uh, Aisha Butler is a woman who lived in Englewood in Chicago. And she just was going to move out, but she said, I need to get involved in Englewood. And she created something called Rage. And she beautifies Englewood. She supports the kids. Uh, Arte uh, Alejandro Artigas de Grac runs something called Springboard in California. And it's really to help parents know how to rate, relate to their local schools so the teachers don't treat parents as an impediment, but as a partner. And all these people are weaving community. And I figure our job, sort of as semi-journalists, is to tell their stories. Uh, social society changes when a, a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy them. And, and I found these people have found a better way to live and it's been inspiring and it's been a great way to spend the last few years traveling maybe to 35, 40, sometimes 45 states a year and meeting weavers and trying to tell their stories. It's also given me a perspective because I, I get out of DC uh, and I see the country from the ground up. Uh, in McCook, Nebraska, I ran into a woman named Rhonda who is not a formal weaver, she doesn't have an organization, but she does what people do in a lot of small towns. She has like nine different jobs. She drives a school bus, she coaches the swim team, she runs a local music festival, she has nine kids, she runs triathlons. Uh, she's just someone who, when you need somebody to go to, you go to Rhonda. And when you see society at that level, A, you see something that we often don't cover because we're so interested in strife and driving eyeballs with negative emotion. And we have a bad theory of social change often in journalism. We think if we expose something as wrong, then we've done our job. We don't have to worry about showing the good things that are happening. And I think that has an effect of disempowering our readers and viewers. And, and so it's good. To, and I've really come to value local journalism and alternative forms of journalism who are doing that. Some of you probably know the Community Solutions Journalism Network. And that's just a fuller picture of reality. Uh, anyway, I'd, I'd love to talk about journalism, about community. I'll give a five minutes on my mega view of the world, and then we can have a conversation, just because I thought it might be useful to have one person's opinion on what kind of world we're now living in, and what kind of society we're doing, trying to do our work in. And I'll start with an interview. The longer I spend in journalism, the more I come to value the interview. That's our form, sitting down and talking to people. You can cite polling data, but unless you're interviewing people, you're not really getting a sense of who they really are. And this interview was something one was I did in 1991, and it was in Moscow, and the Soviet Union was dying, but they launched a coup against Boris Yeltsin, and Yeltsin had stood them down, and he had stood up on a tank near the Russian Parliament building and said, "I dare you to shoot me," and they did not dare, and so Yeltsin defeated the coup. And in that crowd, I met a woman who was 93 named Valentin Kosieva, and she had been part of the a victim of the pogroms uh, that happened before the Russian Revolution. This woman was 93 when I met her. Victim of the pogroms before the Russian Revolution, uh, had family members killed, more family members killed in the Russian Civil War that happened after the revolution. 
Her husband was taken away in the 30s and sent to Siberia and he disappeared. She never heard from him again. Her son was joined the army in World War II and was beaten to death by the Gestapo. Uh, she had been placed in a, uh, she'd been sent to exile because she was part of a disfavored ethnic group by Khrushchev in the 50s. In other words, every bad event that had happened in Soviet history happened to her. And I met her at 93, having seen the beginning of Russia, the Soviet Union, now seeing the end and championing the forms of democracy. And I think of that moment just because it was a great interview, one of the best I've ever done. It was gripping. But it was also um, a moment of, of high, of what you could call naive globalization. In the 90s, we had a sense, in a false sense, that if we just globalized the economy, everybody would be fair. If the technology would bring us all closer together, that if we created a loose individualistic world, people would be able to find um, uh, comradeship and social solidarity. And we were naive a lot of, about a lot of things, naive about technology, naive about globalization, naive about the fact that a lot of people, especially in places like Russia and elsewhere, would simply use their power to steal and steal whole societies. And so we've coming out of that period of naive globalization. And if you look at young people in particular, they've lived entirely in that, this period of disappointment. And if you ask people my age, do you think most people can be trusted? Eh, 40 or 50% say yes. If you ask people under 35, 65% say, say no, most people cannot be trusted. 73% say um, most people are selfish and out for themselves. Uh, 19% say, I can trust the institutions of my society. And in this age of disappointment, you get a lot of distrust, and that's earned distrust. People look around, look at the financial crisis, look at the last few years, and think, I, this society just can't be trusted right now. It's not living up, up to its ideals. And when you get these falls in trust, falls in faith in society, falls in faith in institutions like the media, you tend to have moral convulsions. And the Harvard um, political scientist Samuel Huntington wrote a book in 1981 saying, America has moral convulsions every 60 years. And so we had one in 1770. We had one in 1830 with the Jacksonians. We had one um, in the 1890s of the progressive era. We had one in the 1960s. And in 1981, he said, you know, around about 2020, I suspect America will have another moment of moral convulsion. And that's what we're having. And I think it started around 20. 12, 2013, you saw the rise of the populist movements. You saw the, the murder, the police murders of various African-American men and the rise of BLM. You saw the rise of groups on left and right, of students on campus saying life is not acceptable right now. And so what you began to see is tumult, a period of intense tumult, which is what presages social change. And you can never tell which way it's going. But it tends to happen when a new idealistic generation comes on the scene. It tends to happen where there's a new mode of communication that widens the voices that can be held. It tends to happen when new groups formerly outside the power structures of society demand access to the power structures of society. And to me, those of us who are doing this work and all of us in, in this society are living in a moment of moral convulsion. And it's, it's hard to know where things are going. And it's hard because passions are high. Uh, and you're just riding these storms of passion, these storms of, of gigantic news stories. And to me, when COVID hit and the Floyd killing happened, that wasn't the earthquake. The earthquake had already happened. That was the hurricanes that happened in the earthquake. So the earthquake revealed the divides in our society. And the, earth, and the hurricane showed, just poured water and revealed them even more. And so it just becomes a moment of hyper tumult and hyper change. I happen to think out of this change, good things are happening. I think in COVID, the first days of the lockdown, we, um, we discovered we could show up for each other, especially on the local level. If you ask people before, are we a divided nation? 84% said yes. But in the first March and April and May, people looked at neighbors looking after each other, local stores opening up their uh, kitchens as food pantries. And you began to see people feeling better about their neighbors, people feeling better about themselves, feeling better about society. And then politically, you look at what's happened. And to me, something I think impressive has happened. We used to be 50-50 nation. Every poll you looked at was 50-50. That's simply not the case anymore. If you ask people, do you support 
uh, the, the federal bailouts, 89% of Republicans and 89% of Democrats said yes. Do you support the lockdown? 77% say yes. Do you support, uh, do, will, will we need more bailouts? 70% say yes. All of a sudden, in poll after poll, we're not seeing the normal 50-50. We're seeing uh, 70-30, 65-35. Suddenly, things are shifting. That is even reflected in the, um, the president's poll ratings. He was like at 42 approved, 50, 49 disapproved for the longest possible time. Now, Joe Biden has, according to the latest June polls, often 11, 12 point leads. The president's approvals have shrunk. It looks like there's more, the country is moving left and it looks like it's moving left uh, in a pretty significant way. And it's very early to tell how we're doing on race, but I think this period of discomfort, and I'm looking at the hopeful side, has been a, po a period of useful discomfort and useful for people learning about what the realities are around. And that's our job to try to give voices to the people who can express the realities around. I was struck by a Wall Street Journal poll saying, do you think the, lot, the, the rioting is more to fear or police violence? By two to one majorities, people thought police violence was more to fear. Uh, people after their Garner shooting in 2014 or killing were, um, were asked, are African-Americans disproportionately affected by police brutality? And after that killing, and even after the, the non-indictment, uh, only 38% of Americans said believe that. Now after Florida, 58% of Americans support that. So we're seeing these massive shifts. I just read a poll 20 minutes ago, the majority of Americans now favor taking down uh, the Confederate statues. And so what you see at these moments are these radical shifts, and radical shifts, uh, I hope in positive ways, but we're here in journalism trying to navigate uh, these shifts. Uh, and so in my view, what we do is the problem with a lot of our problems in society is that we, um, we, we don't see each other. We don't care voices for each other, don't meet each other. You know, one of the things I did after the Trump victory is I spent all this time, as I said, going around the States interviewing Trump voters. If you don't interview, you don't know. And so I've, I've come to believe that giving voice to that is what we do and telling the stories of all sectors of society so we can have a pluralistic society where we actually know each other. And that is one of journalism's great jobs. If we look at other people as groups, if they feel voiceless, then we don't have a pluralistic society. And so I'll close just by talking a little about the times we've been in the news um, and a little about my thinking about that and mostly the Tom Cotton op-ed and the removal of my boss, um, James Bennett and friend, James Bennett. Now, um, the Times has written the Tom Cotton op-ed and I think we've now written 5,000 op-eds about the Com Tom Cotton op-ed. We have certainly covered ourselves. My own view goes back to what I said earlier about voices, voices in the room. One of the flaws we did not have now universally acknowledged that in the chain of command and the opinion section, we just have African-American voices who are at the top who could say, hey, let's be prepared for this moment. This may be a flag. And that was a voice that wasn't in the room. I think a core, another problem for the Times is that 42% of America support Donald Trump or 39, whatever it is. To my knowledge, we do not have a single person at the Times who supports Donald Trump. And that's true, by the way, of every major media organization I know, at least on the East Coast and West Coast. And that's a problem to me. If you tell 42% of America or 39% of America your voices aren't worth hearing, they're going to react badly. Uh, and if you tell them your voices aren't worth hearing, we're not going to hire you, you're not going to be in the room, then you won't really know the country. And so when I looked at that op-ed, I'm not a fan of Tom Cotton's, and I strongly disagreed with the op-ed. I think bringing troops on the streets was a crazy idea. But I'm, my bias is in favor of trying to get some Trump voices into the newspaper. I just think it's an education in people. Uh, I also thought, you know, even today, 58, or back then, 58% of Americans supported the idea that he was proposing. Um, and if a position is held by 58% and it's done by a rising senator, people can make up their own minds. They can read what he says and decide it's stupid, which is what a lot of people did. Now, I understand the other side. We've had a long set of discussions uh, about whether it was harmful to people. But I remain committed to the idea of journalism that um, we give voice. 
uh, and 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 whether we like the voices all the time or not, the bias should be to giving voice and to telling stories and not closing off voice. And so, of course, I wouldn't do that to everybody. There are limits, but I thought it, it was the right thing to do. And I think it's the right thing to do, and I'll close with this, just uh, especially now. And I will say, I, I'd love to hear how you guys feel. For me, working for profit, the chase for eyeballs has become a dominating concern. It concerns me that the Washington Post has a scoreboard where you can see what the most viewed is. I try not to do it, but of course, when I write a column, I look to see how it's doing on the most viewed. It's become chasing eyeballs and too much that's just confirmation journalism. And so even for the, there are so few people who are making money at this anymore, even for those who are for profit and making money, the need to chase the eyeballs is the daily challenge, the daily thing, temptation to be resisted. And to the extent that you guys can build local storytelling, diverse storytelling, and um, to do it in a way that's not about confirmation, but about telling alternative stories. To me, that's, and telling local stories that are sometimes about positive things. To me, that's the, the resurrection of, of American journalism and, and the future of a large part of it. So thanks very much. Thanks, David. We do have um, some questions coming in. I'm gonna start with, well, and there were quite a few that are coming up around voice and this issue of giving voice to um, a lot of people. And uh, Christine Schmidt, uh, who is with Democracy Fund, asked, it, what do you think about the difference? You were talking about giving voice and amplifying voice. The people who are out there have voices. Is it a matter of, um, you know, it, giving them a chance to amplify their voice? Or do you see the role of the New York Times or the other media as, as giving them a voice? If yeah, yeah I, I spoke imprecisely. They have voices. Um, and so I would say there are, there are different social roles in any neighborhood. One of them is the, the innovator, the rebel, the builder. But I think there's a role for illuminator. And to be an illuminator, you have to say, you have, there has to be some humility there. I'm not controlling you. I'm not saying what they should say. I'm just illuminating some good thing. And I'll, so I, I think it's about platform. And frankly, you know, how I think about Weave is, and to be perfectly blunt, a lot of the people we try to highlight, we make videos about, we try to tell their story. I talk about them in speeches like, like Alejandro or, or, um, or Pancho. Um, they're really working doing their work. They're working with the community. They don't have time to have press releases. They don't have time to do publicity campaigns. They frankly are sometimes so close to the neighborhoods, they don't even have time to do foundation grants and all that kind of stuff. But if I can use the platform of the Aspen Institute, the platform of the New York Times, the platform of PBS, uh, and other platforms to show them these people are out there, A, honor them, B, maybe you could be a little more like them, uh, that's just using, frankly, privileged and elite platforms to shine light on people who deserve um, to be honored and, um, and emulated. There was a conversation earlier uh, in our conference with Facebook about the controversies Facebook's in about not <laughs> about limiting who gets a voice and limiting who gets a voice if they are putting out hate speech or incitement to violence or um, inaccurate information. Um, in this case, the discussion was from an official position, but it can apply more broadly. Are, if you look at the other end of this, do you, what are your views on, are there limits to who should get a voice or, or using these platforms, whether it's the New York Times or Facebook or anything that can, can really amplify a discussion and, and should there be limits on that? Yeah. I think def depending on who you are, there I think there should be limits. Uh, we, and I think a lot of us in this room, are publishers. And so we clearly limit uh, who, who has access to our platform. Uh, we decide based on editorial quality and a whole range of things. We're not going to publish anything that incites violence or incites hatred. Uh, and so we, we have standards of quality. Uh, platforms, obviously, like Facebook and, and Twitter, have looser standards. Uh, and I, when Trump, it's now like 16,000 outrageous tweets ago, 
But he did some tweet, which I think was considered, oh, I think it was the, if you loot, we shoot sort of tweet. And I think Twitter was right to let it go out, but to mark it. And I sort of like the idea that we have communal standards that references to violence of that say, we're not gonna censor the president of the United States, but we're gonna say, this is beyond our norm. And to me, one of the things that's happened in political speech is uh, the norms have been eroded. And when norms of civility get eroded, it's just dog eat dog. And so I do think um, there should be, there are gonna be limits. And obviously there'll be places online and Reddit and 4chan or wherever, there'll, there'll be no limits. But I think for those of us who wanna be part of communities, and you know, when, when I started in Chicago, the newspapers were the community. They were the voice of the community. They created the cohesion of the community. And if you're gonna create a cohesive community, you have to have some sense of shared values. And those are the limits. They're gonna be loose, they're gonna be wide, but I do think there have to be limits and they just have to be, what are the values that people around here wanna live by? And if you don't have those shared values, then you don't have a shared community. That doesn't mean we all have to think the same thing, but there are limits. David, Tom Stites asked a related question. Tom's been active in local news media and cooperative efforts for a long time. And he said, when you're visiting local communities, um, are you seeing a difference in those that are news deserts and there's no news left? Do you think that's playing a role in the lack of constructive efforts and the lack of community? Can you see a difference where there's no news versus there's news? In totally. Yeah, connection? I can totally see that. And so you get um, some places, I think I mentioned Rhonda from McCook, Nebraska, and McCook has local press. Uh, and uh, there's just a sense of, of community, there's a sense of oneness that we all sort of know each other and, and we sort of know what's going on in our town. Uh, and I was in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I was at one of the meetings on, on how to um, boost mobility rates for kids from age three to 25, how to improve education. And what struck me about that meeting of all the leaders of the community was the local newspaper editor was in that meeting. Like he felt, yeah, we have a role here too. We're, we're the press and we have a role here. Um, and where there is no, um, uh, where there's no network or no news, as far as I could tell, um, you just, th th there's a little lo loss of density, density of connection. For example, I, I just did a story before we shut down comparing Compton, which is in South, South Central LA and Watts. Compton is its own city with its own mayor and its own news, I think news organizations. Watts is very similar demographically and right nearby but it's just a neighborhood in LA. So it doesn't have the density, including informational density. And as a result, um, uh, social mobility rates in Watts are much lower than in Compton. Incarceration rates in Watts are much higher than in Compton. And so there's a direct connection between the sense of shared community, both with social capital organizations and with media. Media is just another one of those community organizations and how people do who live within the community. So. Somehow, I, I, I think we all worry about the information deserts. So a related discussion has been happening throughout this conference in um, a discussion of what's happening in, in media as well as outside of media with racism and bias and underrepresentation um, among reporters, editors, you name it, of people of color and a, a big discussion within journalism about, you know, to what extent do we stand back as observers, uh, or Sharina Zimi, who's on our staff here at INM, posed the question, what if we've had an incorrect theory of social change that our job is to expose wrong, then step back? And part of the other discussion was, if you're a person of color and you are um, threatened by the status quo really constantly, can you really be objective? Is that the right thing to be? And does such a thing exist? Just love your thoughts on weighing that. Should we point out wrongs and stop there? Should journalists go beyond that? Does it depend on the, the issue at hand? Yeah. Um, I started out as an opinion journalist and I've been an opinion journalist most of my life. And so when I think about objectivity, I think about objectivity to the facts. I try to be objective to the facts and then state my opinion about it. And so I think opinion is doing very well in online. Uh, people wanna hear opinions, they wanna engage opinions, but it's gotta be anchored opinion in fact. 
And I think people who want to crusade for things like I do um, should be on the opinion side. I do think, and this may be an, an old fashioned idea, but I do believe that in the, you know, I grew up in the, in the separation of, of church and state that the opinion side, we crusaded for things. And then the opinion side tried to be det a little more detached, whereas we were more engaged. And I still think media outlets are stronger for having both those things. Now, having said that, do I think there always has to be, well, if, if A says this and we've got to get to find B who says that, uh, I think that's, that's just an overly simplistic version of objectivity. I think one of the things we do as journalists, aside from giving voice to people, is we want to give people a sense of what is the debate around an issue. And most politics is, is a competition between partial tr truths. And, and it, it's finding the right balance, in my view. And so, you don't know, if you have a Democratic voice, I don't think you need to have a Republican voice all the time. But I th do think if there's a range of opinions, you want to give readers or viewers a sense of what's the range. Uh, and so I still cling, maybe it's my age, to the liberal ideal that, uh, that there's a value in engagement on the opinion side and a value of detachment on the other side. And I will say in my, and this, is, this goes back a ways and things have changed. But when I was book review editor at the Wall Street Journal, I, I noticed two different kinds of mentalities when I would assign a review to an opinion writer or a reporter. The opinion writers began every day with an assumption, they closed it with a conclusion. So they were really good at writing whether they like or dislike the book, but they weren't that great about summarizing what was in the book. And then the other side, when I would assign it to a reporter, they were just perpetually open and their minds were not closing in conclusions, they were just curious all the time. And so they were really good at describing what in the book, but I couldn't get them to come to a judgment. And to me, it was almost like there are two different mentalities that go on in media. And I think each has something very valuable to bring. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask, we have time for one last question. And um, maybe because I'm a Midwesterner myself, I'm picking a question from Sandra Svoboda at Great Lakes Now, which is part of uh, Detroit Public Television. And she said, look, you know, you're talking about um, maybe there hasn't been enough effort to talk to Trump voters or other voters outside of the, the, the coastal norm. And it's still a question. You're, you're there in New York and with the New York Times, and we've seen more and more concentration of media on the coast. And not a lot of diversity of voices of any sort of diversity, geographic, racial, you name it, really in media. How can the major media, meaning national, do more or are there ways to craft partnerships? How do we solve that problem? Do you yeah. have any thoughts on that? Well, I, it's a real problem. And if, if you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> you know, I, I, if you swung a rope in most newsrooms on the East Coast, you'd hit, and you hit 15 people, nine or 10 would go to Ivy League schools and nine or 10 would live in Brooklyn. <laughs> and that just can't be the right thing to do. Uh, and so my answer has been just to get on a plane until this all happened, just to hit three states a week. Uh, and now, I mean, that was hard, but it was to me the right answer. But a, a better answer would be to partner uh, with organizations in the Midwest, organizations in the West, uh, and mostly to get the sense of how differently the world is seen around the country. I ask people in my trips, to what level of society are you most attached to your neighborhood, your town, county, city, state, region, country, world? And most of the people, 5% say the world or the nation, but most people are most attached to their town. The town is the thing they love. Town is what gives them identity. The town is frankly, and when people were trying to figure out how do I, should I leave my house? Is it safe to go out? They weren't looking to national figures. They were looking to neighbors and county officials. And so I think if you're living in New York and DC, you don't see that, you just see nation. And that's one of the many um, insularities that uh, has grown up around our industry, which I think nonprofit journalism and other journalism has an ability to solve because you can, we just have to be in the big power centers to make money and stay in business, but other forms, different forms don't have to, that quite same um, need to flatter the same suburban rich people over and over again. We're working on it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, David. We really appreciate you coming to talk to us and, and uh, answering questions and having a discussion. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I want to thank everyone here for doing what you're doing, please.
Blessings on you.